Hello, everyone, and welcome back to stream two of PrivSec Global. My name is Carl Brown. I'm the head of editorial at GRC World Forums, and I will be your anchor for the rest of the day. Um, if you haven't already, do visit the GRC World Forums page via the left hand menu on your screen. Um, you can register your interest for several of our new initiatives for 2021, including GRC TV with Joe Tidy of BBC News, who you may have seen hosting sessions throughout Privset Global this week. It's a new weekly on demand and digital TV style series featuring news, in depth interviews, discussions, and debates on all things governance, risk, and compliance. So do check that out. Up next, though, is a session on the UK Data Protection Index panel hosted by Rob Masson of the DPO Centre. So, uh, Rob, over to you. Uh, many thanks for the introduction, Carl. Much appreciated. Um, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Rob Masson, and I am uh, CEO of the DPO Centre, and I'm your host for the session uh, this afternoon. Um, uh, by way of some background, uh, the DPO Centre is the uh, UK's Data Protection Officer Resource Centre. Uh, we have one of the largest teams of data protection officers uh, located throughout the UK, uh, who we place uh, into organisations on an ad hoc consultancy or interim basis, uh, or as part of an ongoing arrangement uh, where we act as an organisation's designated data protection officer for the required number of days uh, per month. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, uh, the DPO Centre and uh, Data Protection World Forum uh, launched the UK Data, Prote Data Protection Index last year. Uh, the, uh, the index is uh, it's an online survey that repeats on a quarterly basis. Uh, it's made up of a consistent panel of data protection officers uh, who provide uh, basic details on themselves and their role uh, alongside uh, their opinions on, on a range of topics that affect the privacy sector. Uh, the purpose of the index uh, is to provide insights that assist DPOs in their role uh, and act as a consistent and accurate guide in terms uh, of the ever evolving opinions of privacy professionals. Uh, so whilst uh, the core index questions remain the same uh, each quarter, uh, we also add further questions uh, that reflect the ongoing developments uh, in the market. Uh, this process ensures that the index continues to provide uh, fascinating uh, new insights into how the privacy sector is evolving over time. So uh, if you are a data protection officer uh, and you've not yet joined the panel, uh, then please do so via uh, it's the dpindex.com. Um, and you can download the, the previous findings reports uh, from uh, dpocenter.com slash dpindex. Now, we do expect the report containing the statistics being discussed uh, today uh, to be available for download in the next few days. Um, however, uh, I hope my uh, colleague Lanita uh, might be able to post uh, the links that I just mentioned into the chat for you um, so you can access them directly. Uh, so uh, the purpose of this afternoon's session is to share with you a select few of the results from the third running of the index uh, and to provide the fantastic panel uh, that's been put together for you today. Uh, with the opportunity to discuss uh, their views on these results. Now, my intention is to leave uh, at least 10 minutes uh, on the end. Uh, so if you do have any questions as we go through the session, uh, please do post them into the chat and, and we'll do our best to address them uh, at the end of the session. So uh, it is very much my privilege uh, this afternoon to be joined by a panel of senior privacy professionals uh, who I'd like now to hand over to and provide them each with an opportunity uh, to introduce themselves uh, and to provide a little bit of uh, insight into their role. So I think the easiest is probably go alphabetically, um, uh, not to single anybody out in particular. So um, Anne, maybe start with you. Thanks, Rob. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anne Bevitt, a partner in the international US headquartered law firm Cooley. Cooley has over a thousand lawyers worldwide in 16 offices, and I work in the London office. So I work with a wide range of clients on privacy and data security compliance and risk management. I advise on issues such as GDPR compliance, responding to data subject requests, effecting data transfers, drafting privacy policies, rolling out new technologies in the workplace, contractual arrangements with service providers, internal investigations, domestic and cross-border and notifying breaches, for example. 
In the last 12 months, I've been particularly busy helping clients as they grapple with things like monitoring performance remotely, employee health testing, collection of employee medical data. Obviously, the significant increase in cyber incidents we've seen alongside home working. And of course, the complex data transfer issues created by the SHREMS 2 decision. Perfect, thank you. Uh, ben, I think you come next. Thanks, Rob. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ben Pumphrey. I'm the uh, Trust in-house solicitor for Birmingham Community Healthcare. Um, Birmingham Community Healthcare is the probably the largest uh, community and NHS trust in the country. We've got over five and a half thousand staff spread across the Birmingham and wider West Midlands area. Um, and I lead a small team of uh, in-house uh, solicitors and assistants. Um, and I also get to walk the DPO tightrope as the trust DPO as well uh, for my sins. So uh, I, I joined the trust in around 2015, and, and since then I've been working on the uh, the issues that have arisen from the introduction of, of GDPR, particularly with a healthcare setting. Um, I previously qualified in private practice, and uh, as jumped the fence from private practice to the public sector um, about five or six years ago. Um, previous background was a, a regulatory solicitor. So I think that issue is going to come up this afternoon as we as we discuss certain issues around uh, the, um, the regulation of DPOs, uh, which I know has been an issue that has come up for a number of people. Thanks, Frank. Uh, David, I think you're next. Hi, thanks, Rob. Uh, so I'm David Smith. I'm a data protection officer at the DPO Centre working uh, alongside Rob. I've been there for about four or five months now, uh, providing uh, DPO as a service to any and all comers who need it. Um, my practice is mainly with the pharma and health sectors, especially looking at clinical trials and data protection issues uh, with regard to those. Uh, and the cross jurisdictional boundaries and issues raised uh, when you're running things from uh, from America and elsewhere in Europe. Uh, also do some work with uh, tech and software as a service providers. And before that, my time was in the public sector um, where Ben and I never crossed paths, but I spent 10 years doing uh, data protection in the NHS for uh, a variety of bits of it. So I've worked on the commissioner side and the provider side working for a large acute trust in the southwest and uh, i did a couple of years most notably when the uh, regulatory framework changed over to gdpr for nhs england and oversaw some of the uh, reconfiguration of the data security uh, data security and protection toolkit that those who work in or with the nhs will be very aware of and setting up some of our early national policies and national guidance for uh, all other NHS organisations. Perfect, thanks very much. And uh, by no means least, uh, Lawrence. Good afternoon, my, my name is Lawrence Kivlin. I'm the Senior Data Privacy and Security Manager at Aegon. Um, and I'm also the Group DPO for the UK business. Um, I work closely with all parts of the business, you know, IT, um, legal, the actual frontline customer facing roles as well. Um, just making sure that privacy is something that's considered at all stages of uh, you know, everything we do. Um, it's something we take very seriously uh, because we see it as a potential differentiator and potentially um, something that we can use to actually you know, win trust, build trust with customers, um, which will transfer into retaining and winning new business. Perfect. Thanks very much. Uh, much appreciated. So. Um, I guess let's kick straight off uh, with the first question, if we can. Um, so, uh, so uh, not unsurprisingly, uh, considering the turmoil that uh, was created by the SREMS 2 decision, uh, as well as Brexit and the multitude of uh, new data protection legislation uh, being brought in on what seems like a, a weekly basis, 21% uh, of our panel members uh, now consider uh, international data transfers to be their biggest data protection related challenge. Uh, this is up from 4% uh, in the uh, first index back in July and then 14% in December. So it's very much on the rise. 
Uh, so, Anne, maybe uh, if I can come to you first, uh, do you think this is a trend that's likely to continue? And, and what impact do you think this is having uh, on the DPO role? So, Rob, I think you've been very timely in asking this question of your index, because if you think back in July, we just had the Schrems decision out. So the 4% then thinking, oh, this is this is a really the biggest challenge um, for me as a DPO. Then in December, we'd had the guidance, the draft guidance from the European Data Protection Board and some German guidance as well on what 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 Schrems meant and, and how companies could try and address the issues that it raises. And then now in sort of March, we've got 21 percent with companies actually having had lots and lots of um, experience trying to deal with these data transfers and get them in a form that that satisfies and I think if you asked it again maybe next month which I know you won't but um it might go up even more because we've had our first fine so the Spanish Data Protection Authority last week fined Vodafone um just over eight million euros for various infringements but one of which was transferring data without having the appropriate safeguards in place so I think in short, to answer your question, do I think this upward trend is likely to continue? Yes, I do. Very much so. I think that's for a number of reasons. Firstly, there is still a lot of uncertainty about what additional safeguards are required. So we know we need to put in place a mechanism. We know that mechanism needs to be effective. We know that depending on the importing countries, data protection legislation and other legislation, that mechanism on its own may or may not be effective. And if it's not, we need to put in place these additional safeguards. But but exactly how do we do that? You know, and, and how do we make sure we do it in a way that is um, accountable so we can show to a regulator if they come and ask us, what do we consider that we've taken into account all of the correct things and, and documented it appropriately? And, and I think, you know, for DPOs, that means doing a lot more work. So it's it's requiring transfer by transfer assessments of adequacy so a, a lot of extra effort involved and i think the third factor that means that this is going to stay very much sort of on the top of the agenda for dpos is the um, as you mentioned brexit um, at the end of the year so tying in with your second um, uh, report is obviously the provisional nature in a way. We've got the draft adequacy decision for the UK, but this idea that it's not open-ended like the other adequacy decisions we've had in the past, but is it in effect time limited and will be reviewed. And I think that that creates um, additional and ongoing uncertainty. And it also, as we've seen just in the press, there is a likelihood of challenge as well. So I think all of that means in, in, in short, that DPOs will be spending more time dealing with the transfer issue. Thanks very much. Um, ben, do you have an opinion? Yeah, I, th I think, Rob, in the healthcare sector, this is really um, more of an acute problem than I think perhaps we've realised historically. Um, it, it feels to some extent as though um, a number of organisations within healthcare, from, from my background, uh, are still chasing their tails trying to deal with Article 30 and ensuring that we've got an appropriate register in place. And then Schrems comes along and says, whilst you're doing that, do you know where your or your international data flows are going? And I think for us, one of the things that we um, are really trying to, to wrestle with is the number of products within our organization that at source um, are often are American based and we're using those products and we haven't fully considered the data protection implications of using those products perhaps as, as well as we might have done in the past. Uh, and now we're faced with the reality where often these companies have subsidiaries in the US that we've never previously had to give a moment's thought to and we're having to now run after where all that personal data may or may not be going and what that back office in Illinois or wherever is doing with that with all our personal data. So it's it, it's a very live problem. And um, I think for the clinicians at the coalface, it's it's something um, almost enigmatic in the sense of why they're having to think about these sorts of things when their bread and butter is the delivery of healthcare. So there's a real cultural shift, the cultural leap even that is needed to be made 
in terms of engaging on the journey, particularly within a healthcare environment, um, to to help people understand the implications of SHREMS and just really the worldwide consequences of that decision and how it impacts on their day-to-day -day delivery of healthcare. Um, I thought it was quite interesting the other week, actually, with the um, the French Conseil d'État decision in the uh, doctor case and AWS, um, the, the recent decision by the French court, which um, really looked into how AWS were uh, at the subsidiary in Luxembourg was uh, uh, potentially at risk of um, further investigation because of the risk that the US angle, the US arm of AWS might have been able to access personal data with AWS cited in, in Luxembourg. Um, that case was really relevant for us in healthcare from the point of view that they were carrying out COVID vaccination status data work. So thankfully, um, we're in the position that the uh, the, the, the Conseil d'État did support um, AWS in that case, AWS Luxembourg, which means that the um, the data was was protected and we didn't have to concern ourselves too much with AWS in America because they had appropriate supplementary measures in place. Um, but it's that level of detail that we're now having to go into uh, in the light of SHREMS and it's a really quite a brave new world for a lot of people to have to deal with. No, indeed. Um, David, Lawrence, I don't know whether I can just uh, get a quick, maybe just a very brief opinion from you. I don't think you want to add anything to either of that. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's the, the, the challenge isn't so much the, the third parties you're dealing with, it's the challenge of the, the national governments, you know, so you, you can use your standard contractual clauses still, potentially. Um, but how do you do that due diligence on a nation state? You know, they're unlikely to be very responsive to any questionnaire you give them. Um, and I, th I think that's one for me, that's that's one of the struggles is there's not a lot of guidance on, well, how do you do that? And, you know, due diligence, how do you get comfortable that a nation state isn't going to scupper everything you do with a vendor that you're, you're working with? Um, and I don't think there's really that much guidance out there that helps anybody at all. Indeed. David, did you want to have a quick final word? Um, not much other than to echo what's been said uh, by the panel members. I think the uh, the key concern really is, uh, as Lawrence has just highlighted, that uh, lack of certainty and the risks that that poses uh, in that there's no easy way of signing this off. And I think for a lot of organisations, it ends up being uh, a bit of a decision as to how much scrutiny that they think they'll be under. So. Um, for an awful lot of organisations, I think you're likely to uh, to take the punt and uh, and do the processing unless you're very risk averse. But if you are in a, a more regulated sector, as the NHS is, or uh, anyone that's likely to come under scrutiny, then uh, without uh, an easier way of assuring the data, there's going to be a, a lot of difficulty in in feeling secure and assured in what you're doing. And obviously that hampers people's ability to uh, to grow their businesses as they may wish to. Perfect. Okay. Um, we've got quite a lot to get through, so I'm, I'm keen to kind of move on if you don't mind. Um, so uh, if we can move on to the next question, um, the, uh, the index asks, uh, to what extent do you agree with the statement, the national security requirements of UK mass surveillance laws outweigh the rights of individual data subjects? So uh, this quarter's uh, results revealed a, a reduction in the number of DPOs uh, that gave a score of eight or more on our scale of one to 10. So that was down from 28% to 15%, uh, which indicates that uh, DPOs are in uh, less in agreement uh, that surveillance laws outweigh uh, data subject rights. So um, uh, David, actually, maybe if I can, uh, come to you first, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, I am off mute to get still. Sorry. Um, well, I think first of all, I'm I'm glad that the numbers are coming down, and I would uh, initially say it highlights the dangers of list building. That uh, prior to this, assuming that we don't strip off all the identifiers from people's survey results, then uh, there are a good third of you that thought the safeguards were good enough, and we might know who you are, and we could seek you out. So, I think. That that in itself 
it gives us a, a bit of a, a way in here as to, to what the issues are with this kind of uh, tracking and mass surveillance. I suppose I should say a little bit about uh, what we're actually talking about here for those who, who may not be aware. So there would have been, at the last, uh, the last time this question was asked, uh, we would have just had some decisions in uh, the CJEU uh, against um, ourselves, Belgium and France, all of whom had various uh, fairly blanket uh, requirements in other legislation for us, uh, the Investigatory Powers Act, which asked telecoms providers to do some fairly intrusive things. The UK one was about asking telecoms providers to keep all uh, metadata about their users' browsing history for a year or year plus. Um, and the French and Belgian ones, I think one required some analysis of that sort of metadata and the other uh, to package it up and hand it over to authorities on a, I'd say a fairly regular basis. And the CJEU has held those to be incompatible with uh, with European law. So that's sort of the, the background to this. Um, within the UK, there are uh, potentially certain safeguards built into um, into the way the legislation operates. So uh, uh, for some things, it is the Home Secretary's opinion, which is. Um, questionable, I think, uh, uh, at the best of times, and other things involve uh, the need for um, uh, approval from uh, one of the various flavours of, uh, of czar that we have to, to safeguard such things. But uh, I think, really, we've got two aspects here. One, one is a fundamental one of principles in terms of uh, what do we want our relationship to be with the state, what level of intrusion should they have in our lives. And the second is is one of practicalities. So uh, I would first of all reiterate uh, a line which I'm sure many of you will have heard before from the security uh, researcher Bruce Steyer, which is uh, it's bad civic hygiene to build technologies that could someday be used to facilitate a police state. So if you are keeping uh, a level of data on all people and it's identifiable, that's complete browsing histories across, uh, I guess, all devices held by telecoms providers, that gives uh, the potential at least for a remarkable level of insight into people's lives. And it's likely to indicate a lot of things which we'd normally consider to be sensitive personal data. So uh, sexuality is very likely to be obviously available via people's internet interests, uh, so is religion, uh, so are health conditions, so those those things which we might wish to keep more private. Um, by creating uh, a whole list of this which is available on everyone um, and can be searched without uh, necessarily any need for warrant or suspicion or a very limited uh, set of controls on that, you fundamentally undermine, um, I think, the, the spirit of GDPR and data protection and privacy laws uh, in yep. general. So the state has a, an ability to process data, knows things about you that uh, it doesn't per se necessarily need to. And that I think in itself is intrusive and can potentially have a, um, uh, you know, you know uh, a dampening effect on people's, um, rights their ability to freely associate to uh, to think what they wish to write what they wish i think i think that's um a fundamental principle really of sure. a, a liberal society and then on top of that you've got a whole lot of practical concerns as well so worrying about false positive rates if you're looking and sifting through this data um you have to be very very sure that you're not over identifying people that you might be worried about in national security to, uh, terms whatever we currently think terrorism is um, you'll have a vast amount of false positives unless you um, make it so, so restrictive, you miss the people that you actually want to find, just because 99.9% .9 of the people aren't likely to be doing anything naughty. Uh, you have scope creep issues, so um, I guess there's probably a level of national security uh, concerns which people are worried about, so terrorism, um, be that far right, Islamic extremism, whatever it happens to be. But equally, we know that um, terrorism is potentially defined as anything which is disruptive. And at its extreme ends, you start potentially bringing in things like um, Extinction Rebellion, Black Lives Matters protests, some of those were at their kind of 
more civil and resty ends would potentially be engaged by this and i think i just jump in there actually Dave, sorry um i yeah. just want to uh, make sure i get a bit of an opinion because we, we'll, we'll need to move on so yeah I sorry yeah i could i could talk for hours what you know I yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, lawrence maybe i don't know whether you've got a, a counter opinion on that at all yeah so i i mean i think with national shoe there's, there's always going to be a requirement for it i think the you know most people expect the government to be doing certainly a level of surveillance so that they can potentially detect things like terrorists, stuff like that. Um, I, th I think the challenge is that proportionality, you know, doing enough that they actually are able to track down these people, catch them before anything happens, but at the same time, not holding huge amounts of data about people who are doing nothing, just going about their day-to-day -day business. Um, yeah, I think the, and and it's, it's, it's the, I, th I think the big challenge is, how the government can be open about this without actually putting that, that at risk. You know, because I mean, for me, it's the sort of thing, you know, gathering data about everybody isn't necessarily a huge problem if it isn't kept for very long. But if they then, if they let on that, well, actually we only keep this data for three months, then, you know, people who want to do something nefarious, they'll, they'll you'll work around that. They'll say, right, well, okay, if we do something and we slip up and we make a comment, maybe we shouldn't have, well, actually, we won't make another comment on that account for at least another three months because we know the data will be deleted at that point and we're cool to go ahead and go and do stuff. And it's it's striking that balance, um, you know, because we know, you know what it's like, something something goes wrong, the government miss it because they're not surveilling people. There's like, thousands of people killed in something along the lines of 9-11. And there would be public outcry that the government aren't doing enough; they're not monitoring things enough. So it's striking that yeah. balance, you know, and you'll never keep everybody happy about it. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, Anne, I don't know. Whether, do you have a just a final word at all, or uh, not really, Rob? I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I'm, I know okay. we've got yep. other questions. Let's move on. Perfect. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Um, so uh, in Q4 2020, uh, uh, we introduced a new question that asked. Uh, if the DPO role should become uh, what's called a protected title, uh, similar to many health and medical roles like um, uh, what paramedic and physiotherapist and things like that. Um, so uh, in that Q Q4 survey, 80% uh, agreed that it should be made a protected title. However, uh, this has now risen to 84% uh, in the latest results. So, um, so Ben, actually, if I can come to you, um, uh, What's your view on this and, and uh, what do you think the minimum qualification should be to achieve this status? Oh, you're on mute. I think this is a really hard one because it touches on um, us personally, really, as, as DPOs, as our chosen career uh, profession. And, um, you know, my background as a, as a lawyer was in professional regulation in both the, uh, the healthcare and legal sectors. And, um, so I've seen it from the perspective of someone who's who's currently regulated as a lawyer, but then has also worked from a, from a regulator standpoint as well. Um, I mean, it's clear that the the, the principles of um, uh, particularly the principles that we work to as lawyers they dovetail quite and overlap quite considerably with the uh, the Article Seven uh, rules that were laid out within GDPR. Um, acting independently, DPOs chosen on the basis of their professional qualities, um, there shouldn't be any conflict of interest in the work they do, you should keep work confidential to your employer, um, uh, and underpinned by the protection from unfair dismissal as well. Um, and a lot of those uh, those principles form the nub of the, um, the solicitor's principles that guide the, uh, the legal profession. Um, I think, I think the point, one of the points that I would make is that it's very easy for us to see this through the prism of wanting the, 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 the benefits of being a regulated profession. But as a public policy point of view, the purpose of regulation is for the protection of the public, not the profession. So any, any decisions that are made in a fitness to practice environment are all about, is this, is this protecting the public? from this individual because their fitness to practice might be impaired, committed misconduct. Um, and the regulatory architecture, which sits behind all of that is quite frankly massive. I mean, 
you, you would have fitness to practice forums, you need a regulatory license fee, the, the practitioner would need indemnity cover. Um, there's a whole host of architecture that sits behind being a regulated person. And I suppose the, the nub of the issue comes down to whether the benefit of being a regulated person outweighs the, the burden of all the all the regulatory baggage, I suppose, if I can put it like that, that goes with being regulated, as Anne will know, that the, the, the burden of being regulated is 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 significant. Um and and the the the, the values of those principles that is placed on the profession, and I've seen this work out in the in the disciplinary tribunals, you know, that the bar is set at a high bar um for somebody uh to carry on a um within a profession such as the legal profession or the medical profession. So so I think it's it, it, it it's an awareness of all that goes along with being regulated that's really really key here. Um, I know that there have you know, and people talk about being a certified DPO and what that means, and there's a lot of private providers out there who will provide a, a certification of their course, um, and you know, that that has matured quite extensively really ever since we were back in the day of. The DPO appearing as as the um, within the European Community Institutions Regulation forty five two thousand whatever it was back then. There's always been this theme of the, D the DPO having specific professional skills and qualities and being given the opportunity to demonstrate those qualities on behalf of uh, of the organisation, so that data protection is is properly um, underlined and emphasised within the core of that organisation's business. So. So th there's a maturity now around privacy qualifications within IAP or a number of different other providers. Um, and I do wonder whether th that self-regulation of the profession in that sense is more of the way to go as opposed to statutory public regulation. I don't yeah. know whether anyone else has got any good point. Yeah, on uh, uh, we, we are running very short on time actually. So maybe just a quick opinion from uh, David maybe. Um, yeah, I think two things. One is that the DPO obviously has quite a lot of power in an organisation uh, if their advice is taken seriously. And that uh, that does speak to the public protection piece or the at least the, the institutional protection piece. You need to be sure that the advice you get from your DPO is of a level of quality. And if it isn't, there is recourse. And that's where the indemnity point comes in. I think to give them that power, you need to have people indemnified and if you have them indemnified then the insurers need to know they're up to snuff. The other point is really how as an organ as a, as a profession rather we get to a point of maturity where we know what the the content of a qualification would look like. So I think DPOs come from a range of sectors, a range of background, a range of experience still and when it's working well that plays to our strengths. So working out what combination of legal expertise, tech expertise, organisational expertise would form the the core of that qualification while still keeping everyone happy and keeping the organizations uh, and the role flexible i think is a, a question that we're not mature enough to answer yet okay um so i'm just i'm i'd love to come to an opinion of the other uh, the others on the panel but i'm we are running a little bit too short on time and i do want to have a time for a couple of questions on the end so i am going to move on so uh, apologies if I, maybe we might be able to revisit it uh, in the q a session um so uh, moving on um so uh, uh, our, our panel of DPOs uh, were asked their opinion on whether they think the UK will strike its own agreement with the US uh, to allow for the uh, free flow of personal data between the UK and the US within the next three years. So uh, the mean score on the scale of one to 10 uh, was 6.47, uh, which indicates that DPOs broadly agree that they believe that this will be the case. Um, so, uh, Lawrence, maybe if I can just come to you first, uh, just for, um, uh, for an opinion. I mean, uh, do you also agree that this will be the case? Uh, and, and if so, what do you think the implications will be? Yeah, so uh, to be honest with you, I, I don't think they've got any choice but to try and get an agreement. Um, obviously, the, the EU is going to look at, you know, Privacy Shield 2 or whatever they want to call it. Um, it will almost certainly be challenged the second that's, you know, in fact, before the ink's dry in the paper, it's going to be challenged probably. Um, so, we, you know, you can't rely on that. Um, and I think, that, you know, that's going to take a little while because they'll want to get it right this time. You know, they've had two goes at it with 
um, Privacy Shield and Safe Harbor, and you know they've never done a particularly good job on either one. And certainly, it's it's neither one is something that I've ever been comfortable relying on um, because it's all very much against the U.S. government saying, "Yeah, promise will behave herself," which we know they don't. Um, so I, I think the UK will go down the route to try and get something for themselves. I think the challenge is going to be striking a balance between something that will fit in with the national data strategy and something that doesn't then invalidate a potential adequacy agreement, you know, which it, it looks like we may get, but you, know, you strike a, an agreement with, your, with the US that's independent for the EU and you potentially put that at risk. And I think that's going to be the, the challenge, but there'll definitely be work done on it, I think. Okay. Anne, um, I think this is kind of an area of your expertise. Yeah, well, working in the um, UK office of a US headquartered law firm, Rob, we see a lot of um, clients, US clients, expanding into Europe, and the UK has traditionally been the first step that they make. And um, query whether that remains the case after Brexit. I haven't seen anything to suggest otherwise so far. And likewise, UK clients wanting to expand into the US. So, you know, there's there's a huge amount of data flowing between the UK and the US. And I think there has to be some sort of mechanism. Um, I, I, so I think a, a, an agreement is is very much um, very likely. Um, bearing in mind, obviously, that whatever it is that replaces Privacy Shield will just be for the EU and the US, i.e. we won't be covered under that. Um, and as to implications, well, I, I agree with Lawrence that the fear is that in our um, keenness to do something with the US, we jeopardise the um, uh, adequacy decision that we're likely to get from the EU, um, especially as it's got that, that review mechanism in, um, as I indicated earlier. So um, yeah, I, I think it will happen, but I'm worried about it happening. Perfect, okay, anybody got a very brief opinion? Just for, I mean, I might want to just go to a couple of the uh, uh, audience questions if we can, but maybe uh, Ben? Yeah, Rob, I think it, I think it's good news that the, the US has appointed a commissioner to the EU to look at this issue. So Biden's been very quick off the mark in wanting to deal with this and get something in place as soon as possible. And I think that's encouraging. I think that the, the rock and a hard place type scenario is still there between Europe and the UK. But um, we'll just have to wait and see how it plays out, I think. OK, uh, David, any final comment on that particular question? Or should we move on? Uh, I think move on to audience questions, Rob. Let's give someone else a chance to have a, uh, a say. Okay, uh, so we've only got kind of six, seven minutes left. So um, I've got a question. Uh, just I'm, I'm trying to pick one that's kind of slightly different to the the, convers uh, the, the topics we've kind of talked about. So uh, there was one quite early on that says, um, "Does the expectation of rising budgets indicate a growing realization in the importance of data privacy and consumer trust?" Um, so uh, uh, I, we haven't quoted this, the, the statistics, but the latest report does show um, that um, the average data protection budget is expected to increase by 10% over the next 12 months. That's twice what it was, expect, the expectation was uh, in December. So um, we are seeing uh, uh, um, uh, expectations growing in that respect. So anybody uh, care to throw in a, an opinion? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's the nature of business these days, you know, data protection is certainly in my experience, it's front and centre, uh, the C-suite these days. Um, it probably presents one of the biggest potential risks from a financial damage perspective, you know, with potential fines, potential, you know, group actions, if you mess up. Um, so, yeah, it, you know, I do see a lot more, you know, inquiries to the data protection team around, you know, you know, does this look okay? Does this look sensible? You know, is there a data protection implication in what we're doing in this area? Um, and, you know, we, as I say, we work with pretty much every single part of the company on a daily basis, looking at what they're doing, the things they're planning to do in the future, um, and, you know, trying to make sure that, you know, privacy by design and, you know, how we're dealing with the, the customer's information the entire life cycle of it um, is all part of that sort of day to day thing. So, you know, the, the, and you know, with, with that type of thing, you need the extra budget to, to deal with it properly. It's, it's an extra, you know, you need bodies, you need 
sometimes you need tools to help out with it, but um, it's, the, it's the way things are going. It's going to become a bigger, bigger part of any new venture that a company takes on. Okay. Anybody else with an opinion? Ben? Uh, I, th I think um, that 10% figure, I should probably run straight along to my CFO's office today, <laughs> Rob, and just wave it in front of him because in the NHS at the moment, you can imagine with budgets such as they are, there's a lot of competing risks. I think the main thing that I've, I suppose, been able to emphasise since since GDPR came in is just the, the regulatory profile that data protection law now has, um, and particularly when there's a data breach within the NHS, as we all saw with WannaCry and since then, that the implications of all that can be quite significant. So so um, it's all grist to our mill, I suppose, from that point of view within healthcare. Okay. And David, any, anything you want to add to that? Um, I think, unless it's wish fulfillment on our uh, index's uh, perspective, so all <laughs> DPOs, then businesses are only going to be giving it more money if they think it's more important. Um, the question is, is that because um, the risk has gone up because fines are higher? Is it a, uh, a genuine concern about it uh, because businesses are concerned? Is that being driven by uh, greater consumer awareness and consumers voting with, um, with uh, their feet when it comes to choosing organisations that uh, put privacy front and centre? So I think um, what we need to do is um, make sure that... Um, we are doing that and uh, that extra money when it becomes available is for uh, genuine improvements and for the right reasons and we use it as a way of marking out um, privacy forward businesses that want to do it because it's the right thing not just because they know they need to put more money aside for a rainy day or to fix bad practice okay and any uh, comment i might squeeze in one one of our last little questions but i'll let you do the last question then rob okay so um very very quickly because i'm conscious we've got two minutes left but um uh, so we're waiting for the Supreme Court's decision in the uh, Lloyd versus Google Safari workaround case. Um, that's likely going to set the scene uh, for uh, future group actions in the UK. Uh, uh, we asked the panel um, how exposed they feel their organisation is to a high risk of group actions, uh, should they obviously uh, suffer a personal data breach. 45% uh, of the panel gave a score of four or less um, on our scale of one to 10 indicating that currently at least it's not considered of great concern. So just very generally, maybe we could have a very quick opinion um, as to whether you feel that uh, that's something that, you know, either your organisation or the organisation you represent um, are, are, should be concerned of. Yeah. And as, uh, as the lawyer, I don't, oh, sorry, Lawrence, you go for it, yeah? Yeah, I mean, certainly it's something that we are aware of, you know, and I think when you, you look at things like the British Airways one, um, it, it's a long-term thing, you know, because there's now adverts on the television regularly reminding you about a breach that happened a couple of years ago. Um, yeah. So it, it, it's not one of these things where it happens after a few months, it's kind of died down, it's gone away. It, this is going to go on for a long, long time. So it's not just the monetary things, it's the reputational damage as well and the ongoing reputational damage of that. Yep. And final comment? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I think, you know, they're they're relatively new in in. Um, the UK, these sort of um, class actions. Um, but I think, you know, we get advanced, uh, adverse findings by a data regulator, um, especially when you see sort of major fines coming out, like we have seen so far. And that's, um, you know, very impactful on a company's liability to data subjects and can give a real boost to affected individuals looking to get a class action up and running. Um, so I think we are going to see, you know, an increasing number of these. And I think companies are right to be you know, very worried about that prospect. Perfect. Okay, well, I'm going to have to draw it to a close there on getting um, getting the nods. Uh, but thank you ever so much for your time uh, this afternoon. It was a really fascinating panel. Thanks, uh, you know, for all your valid and, and um, very interesting opinions. So um, uh, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to host the session today. And, and I'll, I think I'm handing back to Carl. Thanks, Rob. And indeed, thank you to the whole panel. Um, it was a really fascinating debate there about the shift in sentiments and attitudes among DPOs in the UK, as revealed through the UK Data Protection Index findings. And um, do keep an eye out for the full report of the findings that should be available soon. Um, just a reminder, once again, that you can visit the GRC World Forums uh, page via your left-hand menu. 
and among many other things you can register for your interest in GRC World Forums publications which offers unlimited access to a library of articles, reports, ebooks, white papers and on-demand videos. Um, join us in a few minutes time though for uh, our next session which is on the EU-US Privacy Shield. Thank you.